In this episode, we will explore the soap opera legacy of the Pertwee family, one of the worst soap operas ever made, some truly terrifying puppets, and one of the finest action spy shows ever broadcast. This is British Broadcast, a history of lost television. The Grove Family The Grove Family was a British television series soap opera, generally regarded as the first of its kind broadcast in the UK, made and broadcast by the BBC television service from 1954 to 1957. The series concerned the life of the titular family, who were named after the BBC's Lime Grove Studios where the programme was made. The lower middle class Grove family live in the London suburb of Hendon. Patriarch Bob Grove is a builder, allowing the show to demonstrate basic home security. He lives with his mother, his wife, and their four children. The first episode shows the family making their last mortgage payment, and over the course of the series, Bob tries to grow his business and attain prosperity in post-war Britain. The fourth episode shows Gran buying the family a television set, a sign of the new consumerism. The program was written by Roland and Michael Pertwee, the father and elder brother respectively of actor John Pertwee, better known for Doctor Who and Wurzel Gummidge. As was common for British television at the time, the series was broadcast live and very few episodes survive in the archives. It can be assumed telerecording for overseas sale was not considered a viable option for a predominantly London-based show with very English themes and humour, and reruns being considered was unlikely given it was a show produced to pump out episodes constantly something that hasn't changed much in the last 60 years. Only three of the original 148 episodes are known to exist. One of the few surviving shows was transmitted on BBC4 during 2004, presumably to celebrate the show's 50th anniversary. A film version produced during 1955 by The Butcher's Company, written by the Pertwees and featuring the television cast, also exists as an example of the series. The film was titled It's a Great Day, and shown on the Talking Pictures TV channel in July 2017, and can be bought on DVD. During 1954, The Grove Family was viewed by almost a quarter of British people with a television. The show was reportedly brought to an end when, after three years writing, the Pertwee's request for a break was refused by the BBC, with the corporation preferring to cancel the popular series altogether. Peter Bryant, who featured in a major role as Jack Grove, would become producer during the Troutman era of Doctor Who suffering a similarly tight schedule with episodes pumped out yearly at the maxim. Christopher Beanie, who played the teenage Lenny Grove, later featured in the series Upstairs Downstairs between 1971 and 1975, and actress Ruth Dunning, who played Gladys Grove, later won a BAFTA award for her work on Armchair Theatre. During 1991, during a special day of programming on BBC Two to commemorate the closing of Lime Grove, a new edition of the programme was shown, a modern production of one of the original scripts with the roles filled by popular television soap opera actors of the time, including Leslie Grantham, Anna Wing, Sue Johnston, Nick Berry, Sally Ann Matthews, as well as Paul Paris and Kelly Bright. Crossroads Crossroads, also known as Crossroads Motel and Crossroads King's Oak during its later run, is a British television soap opera that ran on ITV over two periods, the original 1964 to 1988 run, followed by a short revival from 2001 to 2003. Set in a fictional Midlands motel, later Hotel and the Revival, Crossroads became a byword for cheap production values, particularly in the 1970s and early 80s. Despite this, the series regularly attracted huge audiences during this time, with ratings as high as 15 million viewers. The show once aired many times as five episodes a week, and remains fondly remembered as much as it was hugely popular. The show later received much criticism from fans during the revival era, and the short-lived attempt to relaunch it led to Jane Asher, one of the stars, actually apologising for its failure to impress the fans, who had long since been waiting for a continuation. Despite its warm fan reception, the show was consistently panned by television critics well before the revival, as soon as it started in the 1960s, as a matter of fact but the public loved it and ate it up like fine rice. Despite its popularity, out of 4,522 episodes produced, roughly 2,854 are missing, with another two existing in much lower quality than broadcast, and some episodes originally produced in colour only existing as black and white film copies. Network issued four volumes of the series on DVD in 2005, with 12 of the original ATV episodes in each volume. The first release included Meg's 1975 Wedding, which is the highest rated episode in existence. The third release was delayed due to the loss of ATV documents listing which episodes still existed, and Granada television staff having to use other resources to locate missing episodes. 
or episodes that they weren't sure that existed or not. Crossroads Volume 3 was released on the 26th of February 2007. There are two versions of this DVD, one being a special limited edition, which contains an extra third disc featuring at the time recently found episodes from 1976. Volume 4 was later released on the 17th of September 2007. During that same year, Network was in the process of releasing all known surviving episodes at that time in transmission order exclusively through its website. The first set of 16 episodes was released in January 2008 and contained some episodes not previously available on earlier DVD releases. At this time, there were apparently 1,700 episodes of Crossroads in existence. Most of these are from Central Television's run of the show from 1982 to 1988, when it was cancelled. Over 20 archive volumes of Crossroads, with each and every surviving episode in transmission order, have been released so far, with Crossroads Archive Volume 20 the most recently released. On the 2nd of November 2009, to coincide with the show's 45th anniversary, Network re-released the 21 volumes, including a Volume 1.1, which I'll get to in a second, in a 41-disc box set. The previously mentioned Black and White Crossroads Archive Volume 1.1 has also been released, containing an episode from April 1965, along with a further two episodes, 1884 and 1886, both from March 1973 which were both originally made in colour, but now only survive as black and white telerecordings. In 2017, an episode was discovered amongst 32 film cans in an old ITV vault that had been left for years gathering dust, and was shown at a television event in Birmingham. It's possible more episodes exist somewhere, but this remains to be seen. Sarah and Hopperty Sarah and Hopperty is a children's puppet television series created by Roberta Lee, who had previously created The Adventures of Twizzle and Torchy the Battery Boy. Produced by Lee and directed by Arthur Provis, Sarah and Hopperty was the first production by Lee and Provis after collaborator Jerry Anderson had gone on to create other puppet series, such as Supercar, under AP Films. The show was based on a series of children's books written by Lee in 1960 and 1961, and was commissioned by Associated Rediffusion. Certain puppets from the series would later be revamped for use in Provis and Lee's next series, Space Patrol, which is more fondly remembered. The series revolves around Sarah Brown, who lives with her parents above their toy repair shop, The Toy Hospital. One day, an old man brings in a broken wind-up toy called Hopperty to sell. He found the toy in a goblin ring, and it is a magic toy. The toy, called Hopperty, can sing and dance, but it is a falling over dance as the toy only has one leg. Her parents want nothing to do with the toy, but Miss Julie, who lives up in the attic and makes clothes for all the toys, gives Sarah the money to buy Hopperty. The old man accepts sixpence, and Sarah washes the dirty toy while her father finds a leg for the toy, but it is a bit shorter than the other leg. When wound up, the toy dances and sings his annoying Tiddle Tum Tiddle Dee song which Sarah somehow understands and, being very naughty, Hopperty's ideas often lead Sarah into trouble, though she tells them that Hopperty told her to do it, naturally, no one believes her. The show ran for 52 13-minute episodes on ITV, running from the 27th of February 1962 to the 26th of February 1963, though the series' copyright dates back to 1961. The series was syndicated at least until the early 70s. Since then, the series' original tapes have disappeared from the archives of the Associated Rediffusion Archive. They were most likely destroyed for cost-effective storage reasons, or wiped and reused for other programs. A 16mm print of the pilot episode of the series was discovered in the 1990s under the possession of Lee herself. This version was the pilot produced to sell the series and not the actual first episode seen on television. The copyright is given as 1960, not 1961. In 2002, a 35mm print of another episode was discovered in the possession of the British Film Institute slash National Film Archive. The episode was Gregory Georgie Goes Visiting the 46th episode of the series. Apart from this, a small audioless bit of footage from the episode Aunt Matilda's Hat exists, with off-air sound recordings of the show existing in private hands. None of these, however, are available online. The pilot can be found on various streaming sites, and that's about it. The rest of the show remains hidden. The Adventures of Twizzle, which lasted for 52 episodes, is also almost completely missing, with only one episode managing to survive. Paul Temple 
Paul Temple is a British-German television series which originally aired on BBC One between 1969 and 1971. 52 episodes were made over four seasons, each episode having a running time of around 50 minutes. Paul Temple features Francis Matthews as Paul Temple, the fictional detective created by Francis Durbridge, who solves crimes with the assistance of his wife Steve. Season 1 of the Paul Temple television series was produced solely by the BBC, with all 13 episodes set in Great Britain. The first episode was transmitted in November 1969, becoming one of the first shows to be broadcast in colour on BBC One. All programmes in colour at that point had been broadcast on BBC Two. Starting with season two, Paul Temple became a co-production by the BBC and Taurus Films of Munich, West Germany, and was shown internationally, with many of the episodes using overseas locations in West Germany, France, Malta, and elsewhere. During the production of the second season, the producer Peter Bryant successfully persuaded Derek Sherwin, at short notice, to join him on Paul Temple from the BBC series Doctor Who, on which they had previously worked together. There was some disagreement between the BBC and Taurus over the casting of Steve Temple, who had been playing in the radio series of Paul Temple from 1945 to 1968 by Marjorie Westbury. The BBC wished to drop Ross Drinkwater from the role, but Taurus favoured her retention. The series was intended to run for five years, but despite its popularity, especially in West Germany, the BBC withdrew prematurely after two. Hugh Weldon, the BBC's managing director for television, later explained that it was really Lou Grade territory and cited the BBC's preference for such historical dramas as The Six Wives of Henry VIII and Elizabeth R. The final episodes, at least of the last season, all based in Great Britain. Due to the BBC's wiping junking policy for the archives, Paul Temple suffered a fate not too dissimilar to a lot of shows, leaving only 16 episodes surviving and 36 missing, and season 1, including the very first episode, completely lost. Furthermore, five episodes, 48 to 52, only exist in the BBC archives as black and white telerecordings, the original two-inch colour videotapes wiped for reuse. Germany, however, retained the colour versions in their archives. These telerecording copies are also the only ones currently known to exist. The visuals of some of the 36 missing episodes survive in the ZDF TV archives in Germany. These come from seasons 2 to 4, which were BBC ZDF co-produced. However, they only have dubbed German soundtracks. Any BBC tape copies of missing episodes with their original English soundtracks intact are believed to be long gone from the ZDF archive. In July 2009, Acorn Media released the 11 existing colour episodes from seasons 2 to 4 on DVD. Strangely, the same company later released a DVD for the final five episodes using the BBC's monochrome copies as opposed to the German colour copies. The episodes originating in colour were eventually released on DVD in Germany in 2016. In August 2013, Acorn Media released all 16 of its previously issued episodes, 11 in colour, 5 in black and white, on DVD as a complete set. The later colour episodes are still not available on any official UK DVD release. The Golden Shot the Golden Shot was a British television game show broadcast by ATV for ITV between the 1st of July 1967 and the 13th of April 1975, based on the German TV show Der Goldene Schub. It is most commonly associated with host Bob Monkhaus, although three other presenters also hosted the show during its lifetime. Hostess Anne Aston was on hand to read out the scores achieved by the contestants, and each month, a maid of the month, usually a glamour model of the era, would demonstrate the prizes and announce the contestants. When Bob Monkhouse returned to present the show in 1974, he was joined by co-hostess, to Anne Aston, Weiwei Wong, recently seen in The Man with the Golden Gun and an ex-member of the Young Generation and Second Generation dance troops. This was one of the earliest regular appearance by an East Asian woman on British TV. The show involved the Telebow, a crossbow attached to a television camera guided by a member of the public. It shot a bolt at an exploding target embedded in an apple positioned on a topical background, usually an enlargement of Bob's own cartoons. In the first round, the crossbow was operated by blindfolded cameraman Derek Chasen receiving instructions from a contestant. First round winners from previous shows would be invited to the studio to compete in pairs using crossbows fitted with butts, sights, and triggers mounted on stands. In later rounds, the contestants operated the crossbow by themselves, first by remote control using a joystick, and finally handling the telebow directly for the ultimate prize. The last and most difficult task was to fire the crossbow bolt to cut a fine thread holding a small door closed. Breaking the thread opened the door, producing a shower of gold coins. 
Contestants who successfully negotiated seven, later four, rounds of the target won a reasonable prize. Those who missed got a negligible prize. Most who reached the final stage operated the telebow like a rifle, with mixed results. One winner simply stood next to it and used a light touch on the rifle butt, sighting using the TV screen. In his autobiography, Bob Monkhouse recounted the story of a person who competed on the show from a telephone kiosk while watching a television in a rental shop over the road. While the contestant was directing the bolt, however, an assistant came in and switched the televisions off or changed the channel. Another story Monkhouse told was about a priest, who was in the studio audience, audibly praying during the program that he wouldn't get injured by the bolt, only for the bolt to ricochet off the target and land beside the priest. Something of a miracle, you could say. The show was successful enough to last seven years across six seasons, with the highest number of episodes being 87 from season two. It was even revived in two forms. First for a bit on Mon House's Bob's Your Uncle in 1991, and again in 2005, as part of Anton Deck's game show marathon celebrating 50 years of the ITV network, the only edition of the series to be broadcast live. The show was revived yet again as a one-off on Vernon Kay's game show marathon on the 28th of April 2007. Unfortunately, out of 366 episodes, 337 are missing, most likely due to ITV's long history of videotape damage, reuse, and intentional destruction. A lot of the shows were actually broadcast live anyway, and were never recorded Recorded to be preserved in the first place. An additional four episodes are incomplete, and 18 of the complete episodes only exist in quality significantly lower than their original broadcast. Game shows had little overseas potential and even today are only occasionally rebroadcast, so chances of recovery, even black and white film copies, is more unlikely than others.